Good evening and welcome you all to the Wednesday evening webinar of the college. Today's webinar is on scientific publications. And scientific publication, we are focusing on the medical publication and that too on the anesthesia publications. In this session, four young states, they are Divya, Sudesh, Pradeep, and Nishanda. They'll be discussing you various aspects of a journal making, how to make a ratio for the research and publication, how to do a re review, a case report, or latest literature introduction. Most of your doubts will be cleared by Dr. Rageesh Kar, who is a co-moderator with me. Rageesh Kar, I don't have to tell you about Rageesh Kar. He's a professor in Ongo Anesthesia with the All India Institute of Medical Sciences. And more than that, he is now the current editor to Indian Journal of Anesthesia. Most of the times when we talk about research, uh, yes, I agree that the original articles in the form of uh, a research study be a retrospective, maybe a prospective studies, they remain the core of uh, new research, new science, which are added for better patient care. But at times we do require uh, reporting of uh, some significant cases or strategies or equipment that would be a hypothesis generator. And whenever we think of something new, I'm sure that uh, most of the uh, participants who are listening to us, everybody of must, you must have experienced sometimes uh, a rejection letter for your publication saying that there is no novelty into the study or there is no novelty into the article. We are thinking of that if the article is not novel, why should we do it? Is it unethical uh, to do an article which is already published, a science which is already known? And when we think of some normality, it cannot be coming out of a view. It will come somewhere from your experience. And there has to be something which supports it. And this will support in the form of a case series or a letter to editors or a small reports. And that's why we say usually that these becomes a NIDAS for getting a new idea or a hypothesis generator. So taking it forward, uh, our first session uh, will be by Dr. Divya Zan. Uh, we'll be talking about uh, the letter to editors, which are one of the very important aspect of sharing something new, which we have realized into the science and bringing it to the readers so that uh, they can try to think. I will not say that it will translate directly into the clinical practice, but it will make the readers and the researchers to think that how this novel idea can be brought to clinical practice. And I'm sure uh, Dr. Divya Jain is the right person uh, to take this topic forward, that what are the essence that should be then letter to editors so that they are accepted as soon as you submit. Madam is a well-known personality. She is a professor at uh, Postgraduate Institute of Medical Education and Research. She has a vast experience. She has been like a teacher to me. I've learned a lot from her. She has uh, areas of interest in airway management, obstetric, pediatric, resuscitation, and most importantly, research methodology. Numerous publications, numerous awards, but let's listen the most important aspect out of her experience, knowledge, uh, letter to editor. How can you make successful a fast publication of letter to editor? Over to you, ma'am. Thank you so much, Rakesh, for uh, such a kind introduction. And uh, I'm really grateful for having me aboard on this platform. So today, without wasting time, we talk about the first part of uh, today's webinar, how to write a letter to editor. I hope I am audible. Yes, ma'am, you're yes, here yes. and audible. Okay. So in my talk, I'm going to cover not just how to write a letter to editor, but why you should be writing a letter to editor, because this is one topic which I feel uh, people might be reluctant in, in doing so. So basically what we understand is a letter to the editor is a scientific communication through the editor between the reader and the author. Okay, it allows the reader to interact with the authors where he can share his opinions, his criticism, maybe contribute, give some new ideas, a new hypothesis, share his own data regarding a published paper, paper, a paper which already has been published in a journal. So that's 
what we majority as understand as letter to editor. But is that the only part? No, exactly. If we talk, we have various types of other than this. This definitely accounts for a majority chunk of the letter to editor section. But along with that, we have a part which is reserved to the reply to these comments, brief reports, maybe some case reports and case series as well, which are accommodated in this section of letter to editor in any, any journal. So if I look at our own journal, that is Indian Journal of Anesthesia, and you scroll down the table of contents, you will find a section of letter to, letter to editor. Now let's open that. The first part, what you see here, a practical guide to the American society, this was basically a response to a published paper. So that's one part of the letter to editor section. If I look at the second article, which was published, second and the third article, those were some interesting case reports, which also made through the letter to editor section in IJA. So we basically accommodate interesting cases, case series, along with the response or comments to the articles, published articles. If we look at, to, uh, look at the other journals, like just having a look at the European journal. So there they accommodate in this section, they accommodate along with these responses to the published papers, you have some short scientific reports, which are also accepted. So what exactly they are, I'm going to talk about that. Are these all articles which are published as letter to editors peer reviewed? Not exactly. It depends upon what type you are writing. As I told you, we have various types. If I talk about the response to a published article or a comment, they are actually edited and reviewed only by the editor. And the other part, that is the short reports, case reports, case series, are have to undergo this peer review process. If you look at the publication time, yes, it's fastest among all the articles which are there in the table of content of any journal. The fastest I would say would be because there is always a time constraint to an, if you want to write a comment to a published article. Now, every journal, you have to look at the guidelines. Each journal is going to give some specific time where you can write this comment to any published article. It might vary. Some journals are from the print, when this article is printed in the, or comes in the print issue. So that can vary from eight weeks to 12 weeks. Like uh, here we have in IJ, we have eight weeks. Some, some journals allow it till 12 weeks, but bet between that time period, you need to write that. Okay, so the time of publication is also fast. For some journals, it's really quick between one to two weeks, but at times it might vary depending, depending upon how frequently the journal comes out. So it can be from one to two months as well while it takes a little longer for other types like a, a brief report or a case series because they have to undergo a peer review process. So let's com come to the most common section that is how to write a comment to the, to talk, let's talk about the comment to a published article. So basically this comes under the category of post publication review. So what do you understand by post-publication? When you are writing an article, when you're writing any type of an article, so it has to undergo a review process first between the editor and the author, then between the reviewer and the author. So there is some communication, some debate going on. The, the authors keep on answering those queries, but those are not published. So the, but some can get missed. Some of these errors can get missed. Some of the methodological flaws can, get missed during this process. So once, a, once this article comes in a printed form and a reader is going to read it, he might notice these, these small deficiencies and would like to communicate or ask the author about them. So this is what is a comment to a published article. As I told you, it is time sensitive, depending upon the type of journal, varying between maybe eight weeks, 12 weeks. So it gives you a specific time. Once the article is published between a specific time, you can write and ask your query to the author through the editor and very true, it's journal specific. So it's actually the journal in which that article is published is going to write that comment about that published article only. 
So what exactly do we want to write there? So now if the reader wants to discuss some controversial aspects or seek clarification regarding any published article, which interests him, these can be methodological concerns, or he finds that there is some uh, concerns regarding the conduct of the study, or he feels that the interpretation, some changes maybe can affect the interpretation or conclusions, and he wants some clarifications regarding those. So he should write to the letter or ask, he can ask the author through a letter to editor. Sometimes we are, that's a common field of interest to us, any article. So you also have some data. You can give some insight, new insight to it, new uh, objective to it. Maybe share your own viewpoint. Maybe you can share your own data. So this also can be asked, can be written to the editor through a letter to the editor. So basically, as I told you, so these, this was a very interesting thing which was published in JAMA, which told that let these letter to editors form a form of the first scientific discourse. There is a discourse which goes on between the author and the reviewer, author and the editor, but those are not published. Okay, you make your changes in the manuscript, but once it's published and, and this letter, when it's, once it's written, it forms the part of the permanent biomedical record, which gets linked to the scientific article for which it is published through its citation in the database. So that becomes a part of the publication. Uh, very early in my career, when I joined uh, PGI, like 12 years back, I was moderating my first journal club when I came across this uh, article. This was the first article which I was moderating as an as a assistant professor. So, so when you are moderating for the first time, you tend to read it extensively. And when I was reading, I realized that there was uh, some issues, methodological issues, which I was not able to clearly understand. So for this, I wrote down to the editor, very politely asking him that, I feel that this article is of actually great clinical re relevance, but there are certain methodological is issues for which I would like to have some clarification. And the author was really kind enough to provide some additional information which could help clear my doubts which were regarding this study. So this is how you go about, you can actually satisfy your inquisitiveness through this. There is another aspect also. This was another article which was published which showed that the tree review PCD video laryngoscope improved, aided in nasotracheal intubation. So my, one of my friends, a very close friend, Nish, Dr. Nishkash, he wrote down sharing his own data saying that it's not just the, the video laryngoscope, but a newer technique like a cuff inflation technique, which could actually aid in nasotracheal intubation if you're using a video lar laryngoscope. So that was, if you are doing that work, if that topic is of interest to you, you can share your thing, you can read it extensively, you can analyze it, you can add something more to the literature through these letter to editors. But important thing is how to write it. Now, whenever you are writing it, make sure that read the guidelines, what they state, the word limit, the number, number of references, what they, are, what they want, the number of authors which are allowed, how many figures, exactly what amount of uh, so you need to actually see these guidelines. Be very polite. Okay, always address this as sir, madam, or to the editor. This again would be specified in the would be will be specified in the guidelines. Okay, so make sure that you read these guidelines very properly and very carefully. Always start with a very courteous note. I read with great interest your article and try to congratulate. It's not easy doing a study, so always try to congratulate the authors on 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 their work. And then be very professional and put forth your points or concerns, point A, B, C. And very clearly, it should, it should not summarize what they are saying. You just put what are your clarification, what points you need the author to clarify. So if I look at IJA, it very clearly mentions that the maximum amount of the word limit allowed is 250, not more than four references. So for each journal, 
where you want to publish this or you want to write this comment, make sure you have read the guidelines which tells you about the word count, the references, the tables and everything. So never assume a rude attitude. That's okay, you have made these flaws. How are you going to answer? So that's not the, the idea behind it. You want your inquisitor, your query to be answered. Be polite, make rather specific comments. Gen don't make general comments like this. So when, when we are looking at a letter to editor to accept that, this is what we, and support your, all these comments should be supported by some scientific evidence. Therefore, if you have those general comments, it lacks weight. The chances are your letter to editor is not going to be accepted. Do not repeat the topics which, as, which the author has already, already studied. And most importantly, be brief, be concise, and be very clear what exactly you want to ask. So if you are short and concise, the chances of your letter to editor being accepted is high. Why, why commonly I reject uh, these letter to editors are if the article, if just for the heck of it, some people write down irrelevant, biased comments. So these do not get, uh, get them through these publications or it's, they are too long. The mass message is not very clear. They've tried to use some aggressive language, although we try to modify these languages, but many a times that puts the editor also in a, um, not in a good front that he would also not like to accept those letters. If there are too many figures, too many tables, too much data to be sure. This is a very short, short report, which you need to understand. And you should be very clear what you want to write. Other than this comments, the International Committee of the Editors recommends that the publication of any letter should ideally be accompanied with the answer also. Okay, so when we get a comment to any published article, it's generally communicated to the author and we accept, we actually uh, would appreciate if the author also gives back the reply. Writing a reply is not an easy task. It's never easy to take any criticism against the work which you have done. So basically, uh, we should think in the light that it's not exactly the criticism. The people have read your work and now they want to ask you or maybe know more about that. So do not try to be defensive. Acknowledge the concerns of the writers. Again, the language, the way you write is very important. Be very, very humble in writing the reply as well. Show that you are open to con considering their thing. And maybe if certain things they have pointed out, which you might not agree with, give a reason for that. Maybe it can be unethical, maybe it was too costly, or it would, take, it would take a lot of time. So give some clarification, so which can satisfy the reader. So that's the aim of this reply. While uh, when I was writing uh, this uh, study on comparing dexmedetomidine and propofol in OSA patients, we also got a, a reader who was quite interested and he pointed out that uh, you have conducted this study in supine positions and uh, you have not taken into consideration the concept of positional OSA, which is very common. So we really, I really liked this, uh, this idea that he had uh, gave us a thought to ponder about that, okay, this concept also exists. We should be evaluated. But although this, uh, I could satisfy my, my reader by saying that probably our patients were randomized, so the chances of having this uh, positional obstructive apnea was equal in both the groups. But in the next study, when I did on OSA patients, I made sure that we evaluated how many patients were having this positional OSA. So that gives more insight to, to the topic which you are studying if you, if you get a red letter to editor. So basically what I feel is by you should be writing as a, as a writer, as a researcher, why you should be writing a letter to editor is if you start thinking about the same topic, like as I told you better what I did in my first uh, JC, which I was moderating, it boosts your analytic power. Okay. And 
it gives you a stepping stone to it's a, basically a stepping stone towards being a good reviewer because if you are a researcher you have to be a good reviewer also okay that's a part of part of being uh, one uh, characteristic of a researcher to be a good reviewer so it gives you more experience in drafting the manuscript according to the guidelines because these these are the letter to editors are one form which have to give a very clear message in very small words so you get a knack of writing very clear in a very clear language and above all publication to everyone be it an assistant professor be it a pg student gives always is always a feel good factor yes there are certain disadvantages because once it's rejected this letter to editor of this form is rejected you do not have many options because the only place it's going to be accepted is the journal which had published that article it is time consuming it's never so easy to criticize a person if you do not know the facts you have to do your homework well and definitely academically it has less impact uh, it was an interesting banter uh, which came, which i came across when i was uh, reading once i was reading so there is actually two sorts of people one who read people uh, read these are uh, research papers and the others who read and criticize i would say i belong to this lot and what encourages me to do that uh, i could really identify that if that topic is of interest to you and you find that there is certain deficiency or maybe you can add something there that gives you a kick to write and i think you should not leave that kick you should not leave that vigor but definitely the people who are of the other uh, on the other side would definitely say that if the author rejects if the author if uh, the person doesn't reply back then this can discourage but that should not discourage you it always i think boost your confidence once once you have once you get a reply once you have that satisfies your queries as well so that was one part a major chunk the other other interesting part which are covered in this letter to editor sections are short reports now the journals to boost their impact factor have started accommodating short reports that are basically shorter versions of the original research work which is being done so basically they resemble the original article but are more concise why we use it many times the journal gives you an option of publishing it in a shorter form because the data is not that elaborate or if i myself want to communicate my results get the get the article published quickly then maybe this form works well so that depends upon what exactly but but these are very common forms which are now being uh, published so when you are writing a research letter in the form of a short report or a brief communication make sure that you check the journal guidelines especially on the word count the authors the references the tables the figures because like an original article six figures six tables are not going to be allowed it's a very short report you need to be very clear so that's why there is always a restriction if uh, i am very fond of publishing in european journal because that gives you a more liberal word count of 1000 words to write down a shortened version of an original report and they're fast enough to publish it also so there should be not although so when you are reading you should know that how much word limit is allowed how many authors are allowed so i keep on repeatedly saying because they do not like extra things to be accommodated so draft your letter accordingly in canadian journal you have slightly lesser word limit of 600 words to publish your original work so this is just to give you an example this was uh, one of the study which was done by us just a, a a very simple one like holding a face mask using either a ce or a modified ve technique in edentulous patients so the data was not that elaborate and therefore the journal gave us an option of writing it in the form of a correspondence or a letter to editor format so we we went through it did not it hardly took me took us maybe one year for this uh, one month for it to be accepted so this uh, this process is definitely much faster 
then then you are getting your original article article published so in canadian also this allows you a smaller word limit of 600 words but they also accommodate these original works written in a very shorter format other than this as i told you in ija we take the case reports case series how they are written i'm i'm sure dr sunish is going to talk about that but cases that describe no, novel approaches or diagnosis for management or they provide warnings about the potential hazards are more likely more likely to be accepted by any journal now an important question arises these case reports are published as case reports also in a case report section and as now a days many a times in correspondence section so do we want to go about writing in a correspondence section yes to get it an early acceptance we should go about and if i look from the journal's perspective there are more chances that the journal is going to accept your case report in the format of a correspondence than as a case report why so an impact factor of a journal is decided by the number of citations to the number of the articles in two years span so if i talk if we, if i look at the case report then they are just included in the denominator and we all know these case reports are less likely to be cited in comparison to to any other form of uh, like your original article or your reviewers so in contrast these correspondence are not included in the denominator so if if any journal which i believe all journals are sensitive to their impact factor it will definitely publish fewer case reports therefore if you want to get your thing published even your case report or case series uh, it's a very good idea to write it in a concise form in a shorter form and get it through in a correspondence section what exactly i am looking for in a good case report a clear message should always be there a clear educational value which can benefit my readers yes definitely a rarity novelty or a case well done accounts but that's no, that's somehow an insufficient criteria as far as i am concerned when i am looking at a case report any 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 case report which gives some ambiguous message or does not comply to the to the normal standard of care standard of anesthesia care which we provide are a complete no from my side and in case if you are any patient is involved make sure you have taken the patient consent that is mandatory nowadays if you do not have that please do not go through the whole process of even writing a case report and getting it published so this was just to give you an example this nodic technique it's just the fancy name otherwise the thing which we got published in ij uh, was not very very novel but it gave a very clear message that if you are in a low resource setting you do not have to depend upon the high flow or anything very extensive to get these coblation surgeries a small nasal cannula can also benefit so these are the small clear educative messages which can get through in the case report section or a letter to editor section in a case report form a uh, stitch in time say this was a uh, just an example of a massive a case report on a massive tumor tumor embolism that i had written uh, i i actually purposely took this one because at times i feel when i'm writing to an international journal a case report in the correspondence form it's if you have a catchy name sometimes that helps you get through not always but uh, i just wanted to add if you can actually think of a nice catchy name that that at times helps you get through this so in conclusion a letter to editors we what we believe are just the comments to the published articles but it also includes the brief reports case reports and there are more chances that these th these things can be accepted in letter to editor provided mm -hmm. they are formatted well these initial publications can give you a real boost in your career when you are just starting your research career and to me if you talk about uh, because i am really critical when i am analyzing any research paper so it can add a significant perspective 
and depth to the literature. If I talk about the letter to editors, which are published uh, in response to the published articles. Thank you. Yeah, there is. Thank you so much, uh, ma'am, for uh, bringing the nitty gritties of uh, publication in the letter to editor format. And I'm sure that if we keep uh, those things in mind, uh, I usually say one thing, uh, it's just not the authors who need publication, it's also the editors who need good publication in the journal. So I think uh, we are both on both sides uh, floating on the same uh, track. We want good publications. And I think uh, uh, Dr. Divya's uh, uh, tips and key messages will help you to make uh, those publication in a faster way. Uh, I remember working for IZ nowadays, uh, the rejection rates may be a little higher uh, because if you don't take care of these points and we try to reproduce the things which are already known, I think um, no editor will like to, I can put a very blunt word, waste the pages of journal and the time of the readers to read the same thing which is already known because everybody of you are so busy. So be sunset, be specific, and what you want to have, something should be novelty. And in the same flow, I think we'll come to the next session, which will be uh, part of same, uh, Dr. Divya mentioned that we are moving away from uh, case reports uh, because uh, it impacts uh, or disimpacts certain aspect of the journal. Uh, we will come in whether and how we can take the case reports and cases because they are equally important. And there is none other than a better person than uh, Dr. Sudesh Kanan, uh, he is professor uh, Bangalore Medical College and Research Institute. He is a vast experience, a prolific uh, writer, a researcher and academician, a gentleman, absolutely a thorough gentleman. And uh, he is just not the uh, uh, editor for IJ for very long. He's also be, has taken uh, one journal to a greater heights and that is uh, Karnataka Anasya Journal. Uh, looking future uh, into Sudesh for many more uh, novel activities in this field. Over to you to put up us nitty gritties how to take the case reports. Dr. Divya mentioned editors are not interested to publish it. Let's see how you can uh, make it publishable or what key points will make it publishable in certain journals. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, Rakhi, sir, uh, for your wonderful and uh, kind introduction. At the outset, I would like to thank uh, Radhakrishnan, sir, and uh, Dr. Sanish, and yourself, uh, Dr. Rakesh, and all other the team of ICF for giving me this wonderful opportunity on this uh, platform. Um, so today I'm going to talk uh, uh, briefly or quickly about uh, how to write a case report and what an, uh, I mean, what an editor expects from an author when reviewing a case report. So William Osler initially, once upon a time, had told that always note and record the unusual publish it or at least save it on a small uh, save it as a permanent record as a short or concise note and such communications are always of value and these words where well, you take it from me they are definitely useful because many a times <clears throat> these are the things which give us a cue to survive or get through the day when you come across tight situations so now what is a <clears throat> what is a case report case report is nothing but a detailed report of uh, symptom signs <clears throat> diagnosis, treatment, and follow-up of an individual patient. Most of the times, they are the ones which are cornerstones of medical progress because they were the ones which initiate the interest in that particular field. And many a times, they do provide new ideas in the field of medicine. And in the present world, in the present era, where most of the private practitioners and many of the consultants are very busy in their clinical work, it provides a sort of platform where they can, they can do rapid, short communications uh, between the busy clin clinicians and also it opens doors for a lot of research. Whereas case series is nothing but an extension of case report where when you report more than uh, similar type of uh, more than three cases of similar magnitude or similar type and it can go up to a maximum of 20 to 10 to 20 cases and when you present such a series of things without uh, uh, having some statistical work done this is known as case series. Now as we all know, the present NMC guidelines does accept even case series as the, uh, one of the things for uh, considering for promotion and all, all uh, your academic growth. So therefore, case report and case series are not something very small and it has to be dealt with seriously and uh, with a lot of uh, interest. So now why are case reports published? Most of the times case reports are published when, when you notice sudden there is an unexpected association between diseases or symptoms. Sometimes you can also notice an unexpected event in the course of observing or treating a patient. 
findings sometimes can shed new light on the possible pathogenesis of a disease or an adverse effect. Most of the time, we can come, sometimes it can help us uh, uh, trying to assess the cause of a particular problem. And sometimes it can even uh, represent a unique or rare features of disease. And many times it uh, uh, helps in understanding some unique therapeutic approaches, especially out of the box uh, thinking, etc. And sometimes it even it can uh, bring into light some of the variations in anatomical success because no two humans are same in all the aspects. They usually deal with unusual ob observations and uh, adverse response to therapies most of the times. Sometimes it can also present some unusual combination of conditions which can result in therapeutic confusion, like what to go. For example, when you have a regression and a simple thing, sometimes you can have a regression lesion and a stenotic lesion. And many times there is always a confusion regarding what is the ideal technique of anesthesia. So invariably in such situations, sometimes these kind of case reports do provide light into management of such patients. Sometimes it can also help in illustration of a new theory or it can even question regarding the existing current understanding or theory due to some uh, abnormalities uh, in the findings. And sometimes it can also give a lot of personal impact. So why writing of case? Most, if you see the uh, uh, list of uh, ladder of evidence tables these days, RCTs and meta-analysis and systematic reviews are considered the top, as, uh, top of the evidence. Si top in the, uh, they're considered as the top of uh, scientific evidence. However, the case reports are at the bottom. But having said that, it's not necessary that uh, case reports are just rejected, but they do have a lot of value in their own uh, regards for the simple reasons that many a times it can provide a valuable source of new ideas and information. Many a times this cannot be done as a clinical study, but many a time uh, you just see it can spark a new idea or some spark a new information, which can uh, provoke a thought for conducting a research. Many times it can also introduce new treatment for uh, novel diseases and lead to new research and advances in clinical practice. Apart from detecting novelties and generating hypotheses, it also helps a great way in detecting pharm pharmacovigilance. Many of the times, a drug can be introduced after phase three and phase four trials. However, following the fourth, uh, following the phase three trials, it's not always that the drug has to generate a benefit, beneficial effect itself. Many times it can uncover or un, uh, un, um, uncover some of the undetected side effects which are which are not detected in phase one, phase two, or phase three clinical trials. So therefore, these kind of uh, case reporting is very important in the uh, addition of uh, such kind of knowledge to the scientific literature. And also, it has got a very high applicability, especially when certain situations where ethical issues or moral issues come into, uh, come into the fact and it can avoid research being conducted. However, it has got certain limitations or uh, disadvantages, that is, it cannot, we cannot generalize the uh, uh, observations noted from a single case report. And uh, therefore, you have to take it with a pinch of salt. It's not always necessary that we can establish a cause-effect relationship by reading one case report or one case series. And many a times, there is always a tendency for uh, uh, us to overinterpret the observations of that particular case to all general cases. Many a times, we just... Uh, say that, oh, that case report has reported uh, a successful outcome with particular technique, and you try to adopt the same thing in all other conditions, and you may end up in a disaster. Not only this, many a times it so happens that the authors and the uh, publishers may always think of only positive outcomes, and sometimes they may not, may not report or may not publish the ones with negative outcomes. So therefore, again, it can indulge in a publication bias. Being a retrospective design, there are a lot of flaws, which are technical flaws, which were not covered during conduct of that particular case. And therefore, it might not throw uh, uniform light into various possibilities when it is practiced at different circumstances. So having said all these things, do you think still that the case report is a linear thing? No, because as I told, it has got so many uh, potential benefits uh, in the field of scientific literature. There was a need for, as uh, we discussed, as uh, discussed by our previous speaker, uh, most of the journals have come down on publishing the case reports. However, they realized in 2012 or 2013 that the, in, the uh, importance of case reports and they felt that there has to be a separate journal so that uh, which can publish only case reports. Therefore, the important valuable information of uh, individual cases or individual things uh, cannot be missed out. So therefore, a lot of new journals which published solely the case reports came in, such as American Journal of Case Reports, 
our BGM, BMJ case reports, anesthesia analysis case reports. This tells that the, this very clearly says that case reports are not a meager things and they do occupy an important place in the scientific literature. So now once you know that it is a very important thing and it holds an important place, a place in scientific literature, now how do you ensure that there is a uniformity in reporting of cases so that they are accepted by standard journals and they are published easily? So as we go through this equator network, uh, which instead of enhancing the quality and transparency of research, health research, this is a network which brought in uh, uh, various uh, guidelines for reporting of various types of uh, clinical uh, material. So for example, for uh, if you see the randomized controlled trials, it uh, brought in concert, concert uh, statement. And uh, likewise, for case reports, they came out with something called CARE or case reporting guidelines for a care guidelines, which consists of a set of questionnaires. If you just click on that particular extension, you can see a series of questions which you have to tick before uh, submitting the case report to a particular journal. So if you, are, if you have ensured that all the points that it consists of 14 points, and if you, ensure, if you are sure that all the 14 points are covered in your case report before submitting, there is a very high likelihood that your case reports can be uh, accepted and published by the standard journals. Now coming to the contents of the case report. A case report generally consists of five important aspects. That is the abstract, introduction, case report, proper, discussion, conclusion, and references. Many a times this conclusion may not be a part of uh, a case report presentation in some of the channels. However, it can be a separate or it can be a part of discussion as well. Now coming to the abstract. Abstract basically summarizes the entire case. The problem is it's addressing and the message it is trying to convey in a simple, short, small paragraph. So therefore, it's very evident, it is very uh, understood, it is easily understood that it has to be crisp and precise with important details with, so that it can grab the attention of the persons who are reading. Generally, we have two types of abstract, that is a structured abstract and a uh, unstructured abstract. Structured abstract is most often for uh, uh, review articles, uh, it is more for uh, RCTs, whereas in, for uh, these kind of uh, case reports, it is generally abstract, uh, unstructured, which means that you have to just bring in a single paragraph containing all the details. And usually it has to be very short. And most of the journals do not accept any abstract beyond 150 words. And it's important that no references have to be cited in abstract. These are some of the important points which have to keep you in mind. Many a times, if you don't keep such things in mind, this can be an irksome to the uh, editor and this can increase the chances of rejection. Now coming to the introduction, most of the introduction of a case report will generally be give a pro brief overview of the problem that the case addresses or the case report is ad trying to address with some amount of statistical background regarding the incidence of that particular problem and how rare that it is. Because the reason why we have to include all these things is because this is the one which, which uh, emphasizes the need for publishing this particular case report. And therefore, it should always be supported with citation of relevant literature wherever necessary, so that you the uh, editor understands that you have done a thorough clinical, a thorough uh, background uh, literature search before you went into write this case report. And it's very important that you have to highlight what important or what unique is in this case report, which makes it worthy of publication. You have to hit at the introduction itself so that the uh, once the editor or the author reads that or the reader reads this he feels that there is something worthy of it which makes it unique and he tries to continue to read it further and generally this entire introduction part can end with a single sentence which describes the patient's condition in which he is suffering from so therefore that gives like in light uh, uh, um, that gives an insight to the uh, author what to next uh, what to what does he expect in the subsequent uh, case report in the case report, you have to be very, very explicit and it has to be a detailed uh, a description of the entire thing. It should contain the age and uh, it should contain the proper patient details, which includes age, occupation, etc. whatever is most relevant uh, to this particular case report in hand. And it should have a clear history of symptoms, presentation uh, regarding its duration and the presence of comorbidities and what led the patient to particular particular problem and how uh, that problem uh, faced if uh, how it uh, presented with the issue regarding the management. We should also be nevertheless don't forget to mention the important physical examination points in the uh, assessment of case. It should also it's always better to include pathological tests and other relevant investigations whatever it is uh, to support the case so that all these things will help in bringing out why exactly you try to manage the patient in a different way or in a different uh, manner that was which is slightly away from the standard uh, technique 
you can also mention the various treatment options that were decided and what was the expected outcome and what you did and ultimately what was the actual outcome noted in the patients and the alterations in the treatment plan due to the inherent patient problems has to be clearly explicitly explained in the case report and one of the important things you have to mention in the case report is that you have ensured patients uh, safety and you have ensured patients uh, confidentiality while reporting this case and they know where you are not going to uh, indulge in any patient uh, identification factors when you are reporting the case report unless it is very much necessary now coming to the discussion part discussion part is the part which will try to convince the editor or the reader that this case is publication worthy so therefore it's nothing but the expansion of details which are mentioned in the introduction but you should also justify as to why this particular patient was managed in that particular way with adequate scientific support and uh, what were the various uh, prob what were the various uh, uh, situations which led to the management of the patient in such a particular way and also it's important to highlight the important positives and limitations while managing the case it might be limitation of the equipment limitation of the uh, situations where you have handled that patient for example it might be an uh, open air situation or it might be it might be an uh, mass casualty situation or anything like that which specifically resulted in managing the uh, bringing out some of the limitations in management of the patient so that you can you are properly justified in in your management you should very clearly mention what whether the whether there is corroboration or detraction of your management from the existing understanding or existing current knowledge and why such kind of a corroboration or detraction occurred in your particular case this will give more strength to your uh, case management aspect finally come to the conclusion the concluding remarks should the conclusion should have a clear concluding remarks regarding the case it's important to note that you don't repeat whatever you mentioned in the discussion or whatever you mentioned in the methodology case report section again in the conclusion conclusion should be very precise brisk and it should be very clear and it preferably as far as possible as short and succinct as possible sometimes some of the journals do ask for a summary and you can add that particular summary in conclusion if uh, uh, it is desired by the specific journal author suggestions and recommendations are were suggested in some of the earlier journals however the present journals do not ask for author suggestion because it is uh, usually it can be there is always a possibility of bias here because you are actually entirely dependent on one particular case uh, when you make a suggestion so therefore it can sometimes send a wrong signal or it can result in a cautious uh, mode of things so coming to a note on patient consent it's one of the most most important ethical requirement for any studies or even reporting of case report a written consent from the patient is a must before submitting the case report and therefore if the patient is a minor parental consent or if the uh, adult uh, if the adult is unable to give uh, consent then you can go for closest family members to give the consent patient anonymity as said is an important requirement while reporting cases and adequate shielding of patient identity during uh, publishing of images etc is very important coming to some of the do's and don'ts while publishing case reports you tell the case report in the form of a story basically you arrange them in the proper chronological order so that the author uh, the reader can get a visual impression of what exactly happened and specify about your differential diagnostic considerations very clearly so that that will add to uh, the uh, or that will substantiate uh, the way you manage the particular case get the details right it's very important because when the author uh, or the uh, sorry when the reader or the editor re reads and if he finds that there are certain missing points in your uh, uh, in your uh, case uh, report narration that can result in a negative impact it's always important to uh, ratify the differential diagnosis both positive and negative during the uh, uh, your presentation employ pictures and preserves uh, wherever relevant because they are worth a thousand words and it has to be clearly and efficiently illustrated via images formulate short and sharp titles as a uh, uh, madam was telling in the previous talk it should be sharp and eye catching and therefore it can result in greater chances of reading and uh, publication and also it has to be short and clear don't do not write your case report before doing a proper homework suppose if you don't uh, do a thorough research uh, literature search and uh, if a similar article is published in elsewhere or earlier there is always a chance that your article can get uh, rejected and ensure that uh, missing details are kept to a minimum especially with regards to crucial documents and points 
do not publish a case report without patient's consent this is a very very important aspect and it man it can result in uh, reputation and re relationship damage do not include do not include everything don't go on uh, blabbering so many things many times less is more you can restrict to most important aspects and you can deliberate on that only do not discuss uh, disc in the discussion part don't go on um, discussing every single aspect of patient's disease and try to justify each and everything most important points has to be discussed only those things have to be justified coming to what editors look into a, this is the last part of our my talk where what are the law editors look into a case report when they publish when the moment they see the case report or the title and the initial abstract they look for four important aspects one is uniqueness document whether they have documented properly and whatever they have done have they interpreted it in the right direction and they have uh, represented it in the properly in the manuscript and finally whether they have used some of the objective methods to manage the patient or the or the management of the patient is totally subjective without use of proper scientific literature review and finally how much educational value does it impart in the scientific society and most important but not the least is the its impact on the clinical practice all these things are just the moment they quickly glance to the case report and see whether all these points are ticked once these points are ticked then subsequently they'll go into the uh, further articles so further into the uh, further deep into the uh, write up so therefore you ensure that the instructions to authors are followed stringently because that is the next thing so if you see in our ij it's very clearly mentioned what exactly has to contain what are the various headings under which the article has to be written and what all things have to be included and how it has to be included and of course one of the most important issues they look into is whether ethical issues are taken care of whether with regards to consenting proper uh, blinding etc has been done or not so therefore you clearly and explicitly mention these things in your manuscript they look for once they have done with these basic things they further detailed review of the article will look into the authenticity uh, authenticity and the genuineness and if there is any conflict of interest and whether uh, the proper restriction of word count is uh, followed and uh, it's very imperative that you use a good language and grammar when you're reporting your case it's not only for case report but it's, it's good for all the type of publications by mentioning good language i won't say that you should write a poetic language like shashi tharoor but it has to be a simple scientific language where it is easily understood by most of the readers and second thing avoid use of too many jargons try to avoid use uh, uh, use of uh, adjectives and uh, like i this is my view this is my our way, uh, way of management etc because that indicates that you are um there is no uh, uh, a sense of general purpose there you are trying to portray your own thinking and thing then always ensure that you are given attention to details and proper numbering of some of the smaller things such as proper numbering of tables figures and its illustration in the text and therefore the and also important thing is that you try cite the references and quote the references properly in the uh, article as well as in the list of references and also use only most relevant references just don't go on dumping all the references because they are available now coming to some of the common causes of dissection most of the times they are not valid for the scope of results or uh, uh, scope of the journal or sometimes it not uh, that particular journal will will not be uh, working on that particular uh, field of uh, uh, in that particular field which the article is being written sometimes most of the times it's that the does not follow the basic journal guidelines so therefore i emphasize that you have to go through the instructions of authors before writing and publishing the uh, uh, submitting the manuscript to the particular journal sometimes it doesn't match to the current clinical needs many times you will be talking about an obsolete practice which is not uh, relevant anymore so therefore it might not be accepted sometimes it might not be unique or interesting as i told uh, if you don't do a thorough literature search this is the problem problems with the references you are referencing style and your references quoted might not will be very old last but one of the most important problems these days is plagiarism you just copy some other's work and just publish it here so with this uh, i would uh, the take home message would be case reports are very important and they do uh, form a important link between the clinical uh, research and the uh, scientific practice and uh, that gives an important scope for a lot of uh, busy practitioners to express their experiences 
and uh, a good case report written based on a thorough scientific knowledge and a good review of literature is a very high chance of getting accepted case series are still considered as one of the uh, things for your publication so therefore don't uh, think that case reporting is very doesn't have any values so these are my references thank you for your patient hearing sorry thank you so much uh, thank you so much sir for taking this important topic because uh, as an author as a reader sometimes uh, we are perplexed with uh, many of the aspects of case reports and you have taken it we will be having certain questions we'll take it uh, after another two sessions but yes, uh, nicely covered so let's move on to a very important article because uh, when you want to read some journal you want to because interpreting the original articles or the case reports becomes difficult as a clinician we want something which is ready made and some of the expert may provide us a concrete sentence that you manage this patient using this technique and that's why we are looking for the clinical textbooks where as initial uh, residents we can learn those things and that's why we sometimes uh, try to look for the review articles which are expert of team in that particular area try to guide us the management things but yes there will be some integrities because if i write something uh, i will be a biased a little bit about what i do and i try to emphasize those things and i want the word to do the same way uh, dr pradeep is smiling and i'm sure he can understand that uh, reading a review articles requires a lot of understanding even for how to read a review article i think i'm sure uh, he will take us through that what editors are looking for uh, for those uh, uh, participants who are listening to us uh, what topic and how the review articles uh, they are different type and he will be bringing it and the right person to talk on uh, for this topic the review articles is uh, dr pradeep dongre he is a senior consultant at esic medical college and pgims at bangalore he has a great interest in research uh, editing and other aspects which he is an expert he do a lot of uh, systematic review and meta analysis one of the big shots now in uh, various systematic reviews and meta analysis and he has many credentials to it and i think he is the most apt person to talk on this topic uh, how to get an review article published what the editors are looking for over to you sir dr pradeep nagar uh good evening everyone uh, after uh, learning a little bit about uh, letters to editor and uh, a little bit more about uh, case reports uh, we are coming to a section on review articles uh, today i'll be talking uh, a little bit on the uh, types of review articles what the journal expects and uh, a little bit about how to do a systematic review and what is a meta analysis so i'll be giving you an overview of all these things review articles are very broad topics and uh, there are different kinds of review so if you look at the ija instruction uh, instructions to authors you can see that uh, review articles are mainly by invitation from the editor in chief and uh, they are uh, the detailed instructions are given on what uh, is supposed to be the word count and what is supposed to be the word count for the abstract and how it should be the same thing in uh, uh, if you look at jocp or the general anesthesia and clinical pharmacology you can say that uh, uh, you can submit review articles on your own but it has to be with the communication with the editor in chief and uh, even systematic reviews and meta analysis are also included in this review articles and uh, that they should be registered with prospero so again they have their own uh, word limit reference limit uh, the abstract limit and all such kinds of things so what is actually review what does the word review mean uh, the word review means that you are trying to examine uh, examining or uh, reconsidering something in order to decide if some changes are actually necessary in uh, what was the previous uh, thought process or knowledge so uh, what is a review article so there have been various definitions for review articles some of them have said that uh, you have to have 100 references there have to be, it has to be published in a review journal only and uh, some of them have said that it should be in the review section of a research journal or uh, the abstract should specify that it's a review article but actually the main uh, i think the best definition for a, a, a review article as such has been that uh, uh, it is a synthetic uh, review and summary of what is known and unknown regarding what knowledge uh, is available to us so uh, from uh, available to us 
So what is the purpose of your review article? So your review article has to have something that is valuable to the clinician. He is going to learn a little bit from it. From it, it's, it has to be informative. It has to have solid uh, evidences if possible. There has to be uh, criticality in uh, when you are writing your review articles. And this has to be a summary of all these things. And, uh, uh, and there has to be a well-defined topic. And uh, this area has to interest most of the readers. It has to be something which is more recent. So if you take the types of review articles, there are uh, many, many different types. They can be scoping reviews, historical reviews, systematic reviews, narrative reviews, et cetera, et cetera. But we'll just talk about a few of them uh, that are uh, actually you know, commonly found in anesthesia journals when you try to look for them. So the commonest kind is what is called as a narrative review. It uh, describes primary studies. So you have a body of evidence as you have gone through a period of time, you have read a lot of articles and you want to put up a summary of these articles uh, and you have selected these articles based on your interest or whatever. And uh, uh, this is called as a narrative review and it usually does not employ any method of uh, study of the results. It gives, it summarizes what have been most of the conclusions of most of these articles. And uh, some of it may be your own personal opinion also. Uh, historical reviews, again, they trace the development of science over a period of time uh, and have some amount of uh, temporal association. Whereas uh, your uh, meta-analysis, they aggregate results and uh, calculate a cumulative effect. Umbrella reviews are nothing but reviews of your meta-analysis and systematic reviews. So uh, they give a summarize the results of various systematic reviews, identify systematic reviews, and uh, summarize their results, and uh, uh, give an opinion about uh, which would be the best. And uh, scoping to actually talk about the profile of existing studies, what are the types of studies that have been done, extent and range of these studies, but they have no emphasis on the, do not emphasize on the results. Whereas systematic reviews, they analyze studies related to topics systematically. There is a definite attention to methodology of the studies that are incorporated and the results that have been uh, uh, published. And uh, they try to reduce the bias and errors, or at least try to declare the bias that is there in these articles. So if you see here, there is a, uh, this is one of the articles that has been actually been published in uh, Indian Journal of Anesthesia, you can see that the abstract is, has no structure and uh, there is just a paragraph and uh, most of the, uh, 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 the uh, article is based on experience and experience of others. And overall, it does not follow the inbred pattern that is actually uh, supposed to be followed by a research article. And uh, probably this is a narrative review. If you go through some of the uh, uh, articles that are published in anesthesia, there is one article called as Historical Development of Modern Anesthesia, which has some amount of uh, temporal association. So this may also be published as a review. Uh, and uh, uh, it can have, uh, it, because it has a temporal association, it is called as historical uh, reviews. Now, this is uh, taken from the Cochrane database. Here you can see that uh, uh, this article actually has a structured format, has an abstract with a structured format, and uh, there is specific objectives. The search methods are actually uh, pretty well defined, and uh, selection criteria of the articles are also very well defined. Then uh, an analysis has been done, a risk of bias graph has been given, and uh, this was probably a systematic review. Now, going on from a systematic review to a meta-analysis, a meta-analysis usually contains, uh, you do a systematic review before you do a meta-analysis. And once you feel that all the articles, the data of all the articles, there's uh, plenty of similarity between the articles and you can pool the data, there's not going to be any heterogeneity among the type of articles that are included. Then you can try to combine these results and this may give a combined effect, which is important and is shown here in a meta-analysis. So umbrella reviews, again, as I said here, it is mentioned here that uh, they uh, did a literature search, they identified 313 articles of which six meta-analysis were uh, identified and uh, uh, which concentrated on 25 outcomes and they summarized these results and tried to combine these results. So this would probably be an umbrella review. And these articles can also be considered for publication as a review. So this is again a scoping review. It again has an abstract and a structure, uh, structured abstract. 
and uh, this is a re this is a review about retracted publications in anesthesiology, and it has a, a proper objective, a proper method. Results have been discussed, and conclusions have also been uh, stated here. So, uh, coming to reviews, uh, the common kinds of reviews that we see in our journals are the narrative reviews and systematic reviews. If you go, uh, if you look at the first one, it is a systematic review taken from a Cochrane database. Whereas uh, the second one, you can see the title itself, uh, Melatonin in Perioperative uh, Medicine, A Current Perspective. So it looks like a narrative review. So uh, if you look at the evidence table, systematic, uh, the reason why reviews need to be very, very thorough and uh, reviews need to be done with uh, uh, a proper systematic way is that it can be at the top of the evidence table. Uh, and uh, as you see, uh, the top of the evidence table is very, very narrow and constitutes the systematic review and the meta-analysis. Even today, I think IJA and GOCP re receive very few uh, systematic reviews and meta-analysis, but these are increasing day by day, and I hope that we can publish more systematic reviews and meta-analysis in the future. Again, uh, to reiterate, uh, reviews are nothing but they are secondary publications. Uh, they uh, constitute filtered information, and randomized controlled trials, cohort studies, and case control studies, all these are unfiltered information of primary articles which actually do the research. And these primary articles, if put together, constitute our secondary articles or reviews. So if you look at the evidence-based health, uh, uh, healthcare system, you see that uh, systematic reviews and meta-analysis guidelines and government national bodies policies are, are framed basically based on systematic reviews rather than uh, randomized controlled trials and case controlled studies. Uh, so it's important that the, uh, uh, the methodology of these uh, systematic reviews are rigorous. So what is uh, a systematic review and how to do a systematic reviews? Uh, systematic review uses an explicit method to identify, select, appraise, and synthesize results from uh, relatively similar but separate studies. So in simple terms, a systematic review gathers all the available empirical research in a clear, uh, clearly defined systematic manner to answer a specific research question. So if you look at uh, the differences between uh, narrative reviews and systematic reviews, uh, generally narrative reviews have a very broad scope. So if you're planning for a narrative review, your uh, scope of the article is going to be very, very broad. And uh, the sources and search uh, are generally not specified. And uh, the appraisal of the article can be variable. Uh, it depends, it may even depend on the reader. And uh, it usually is a qualitative summary rather than a quantitative summary in comparison to a systematic. So here you can see a systematic review where uh, they have actually a method in the method section, they have identified, uh, they have tried to identify what is the search methods that were used. Then they have tried to identify what were the databases in which it was uh, uh, searched, where they searched for the uh, uh, articles and the secondary databases, the primary databases where the Cochrane Central Registry, et cetera, et cetera. And then they have tried to uh, talk about the inclusion criteria, the types of participants, et cetera. And uh, whereas in a narrative review, it's just a simple as abstract they have talked about what is actually the uh, what is actually melatonin uh, and uh, uh, synthesis and function of melatonin. So it's a general uh, uh, written based on general knowledge that has been gained from reading of, uh, reading up about quite a few of articles about melatonin and its effects in anesthesia. So this is one more component that would be very very important to declare in your uh, writing the systematic review. A risk of bias graph. Uh, so yeah, these are the uh, six or seven points that are very, very important that uh, you have to assess when you're assessing the article. And this has to be declared before when you're trying to publish a systematic review. Uh, yeah. And you should remember that uh, uh, when you label your article or in your title of your article, you should be very clear whether it's a systematic review or a meta analysis because systematic reviews are not always meta-analysis, but meta-analysis always includes a systematic review. So how do you do a systematic review? So there are various steps in which you conduct a systematic review, the first of which, like any other 
original research would be formulating your research question. You have to have the PICO format out and uh, you have to define even the time frame of your uh, search for your articles. Then you can always register your, uh, register your uh, systematic review. Then you have to define your inclusion and exclusion criteria, go through an extensive uh, literature search uh, with a study selection, and uh, you have to grade the quality of the evidence, then try to uh, do a data extraction. You can analyze this data, then give the level of evidence, and you can present your uh, research. So formulating a research question, as I mentioned, would depend on the PICO format. You have to, uh, you can do a systematic review and meta-analysis of both RCTs or observational trials. This has to be mentioned clearly what are the type of articles that have been included. And you need to register your research, uh, determine your uh, uh, primary and secondary outcome, and uh, they also have to be usually registered. So this is a website where you actually can register your uh, uh, systematic reviews and uh, registering it adds one more perspective uh, to it. You are, if you are if it is registered in your uh, Prospero, then you know that there is no probably no similar uh, systematic review being conducted or which has already been published. So it's important to declare that you have probably registered in Prospero. So you have to again define your inclusion and exclusion criteria in detail in your systematic review. You should be able to. Uh, what are the uh, types of articles or study design of the articles that are included? What are the patient characteristics, publication status, uh, language? It's very, very important. If you are an English speaking country and you try to talk about an article that has been written in French, unless and until uh, uh, translation has been published by the journal, probably it would be better not to include it. And you have to have uh, a research search period, you should have a good, uh, you should declare the search period that you have actually used. It may be for the past 10 years, it may be for the past 20 years. So it depends on your uh, perspective. Uh, you should uh, declare what uh, uh, databases you have actually uh, done the literature search in and uh, the study selection. Uh, you, there are quite a few databases such as Central, Embase, Medline. Embase, of course, is uh, paid. Uh, Medline and Central are free. You can even uh, quote your Google Scholar. There's nothing wrong with uh, searching in a Google Scholar. And you have, can even quote your secondary databases that you're searching in, your uh, CTRI or your other registries uh, where you can get the results. Or sometimes they may be even uh, physical. Uh, uh, you may be able to do a literature search in your physical textbooks and get some articles that are related to your uh, research question. So all these have to be declared in detail in your uh, systematic research reviews. And uh, coming to the quality of evidence, it's always better nowadays to declare your, uh, the, uh, assess the quality of evidence based on the grade approach, which is the universally accepted by more than uh, 100 societies all over India. So uh, this is a, uh, so you can always say, uh, that as per the grade approach, uh, randomized controlled trials, you can have a high level of confidence. Observational trials have a low level of confidence. So it's better to declare what is the method you have used uh, to assess the quality of evidence and uh, better uh, that it is uh, the grade approach. Now, uh, coming to uh, data extraction, it's always better that the data extraction has been done by two independent investigators, and this is declared and uh, this data and uh, they have discussed about the data uh, 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 during the data extraction, after the data extraction as to any kind of uh, uh, long data entries that have actually occurred or any data that was actually heterogeneous uh, during the uh, data extraction that they have identified during the data extraction. Uh, so uh, you have to declare, as I mentioned earlier, whether it is a meta-analysis uh, it is a statistical, statistical process of combining or pooling of data uh, that is obtained from these articles. And, uh, and this has to be represented in a common fashion among the studies. You should be able to say what is the uh, type of variable uh, that you have assessed or uh, uh, that has been uh, subjected to meta-analysis, whether it is dichotomous or uh, whether it is a continuous variable. And you have to represent the re uh, relevant uh, uh, 
uh, odds ratio or risk difference or mean difference or standard deviation depending on the type of variable. So this here is actually a forest plot and this is very important to declare your uh, results in the uh, form of a forest plot because this is what gives you actually whether uh, the results favor the intervention or the placebo. So there are different models and it's very important in your systematic review to our meta-analysis de declare what model has been used for analysis of the data. You can see here that uh, uh, the heterogeneity or I square, there's something called as I square, which is the heterogeneity is quite high. So when we did, uh, we, uh, when they applied the fixed model, they found that the heterogeneity was high. So they again applied the random effects model, which may be more appropriate, the heterogeneity is quite high. So if there is homogeneous data, of course, uh, the I square will be quite uh, less than 25% or less than 50% is good enough to say that uh, it is homogeneous data. And this has to be represented in your results. When you're writing your results, you have to say that the data was homogeneous and I square was so much. And uh, yeah, the overall effect size can also be declared. So uh, you have to, whenever you publish a systematic review or a meta-analysis, it's always better to look for the publication bias, uh, plot the panel plot, and this is better that it is represented in your article and shown in your article. And uh, so that uh, the reader or the, uh, the editor is confident that uh, you have selected the right kind of uh, articles, or if there is some bias, you have applied the right kind of uh, uh, if, uh, model to your uh, articles. So uh, you should also, uh, your systematic review should always conform to the PRISMA guidelines. I think PRISMA has come out, come out with a recent statement in 2020. And uh, this actually uh, gives in detail how your uh, systematic review has to be reported. And uh, this is one uh, flow chart that has to be included. If this is a, a previous review has already been done, then you can uh, always mention the previous studies that are, I mean, were included in your previous review, version of the review, and the new studies that have been added to it. And uh, you have to declare even the original of the uh, articles, uh, whether it is from websites, organizations, citation searching, that is your secondary source. And uh, you have to declare, uh, this is a flow chart that, is bet that better accompany your uh, article always so that uh, your editor knows that uh, a thorough rigorous methodology has been followed and uh, he would be ready to publish your uh, systematically. So again, uh, there is a checklist and it's better to uh, go through this checklist given at the Prisma 2020 website. And uh, uh, you see that uh, uh, it's better to show, uh, show where actually, at what paragraph actually, uh, the particular uh, point has been mentioned. For example, identify the report as a systematic review. So the title should contain the terms that it's a systematic review or it's a meta-analysis. Uh, and you have a checklist for abstract and uh, similar kinds of checklists. So you should go through the whole Prisma guideline as you're uh, writing the article and try to uh, include all the aspects. Remember that when it comes to a meta-analysis, garbage in is garbage out. So you have to be very, very careful when you're trying to do a meta-analysis of what you're going to include in your, uh, what kind of studies you're going to include and what kind of uh, statistics you're going to portray because uh, uh, it may have convey no meaning and in the end you may not be able to get a proper conclusion. And uh, there are ways to detect that uh, this may not be an appropriate test or an appropriate uh, method for your systematic review. So definitely uh, uh, an expert in this will be able to detect that. Uh, but if properly done, conducted, your, uh, it is the highest level of evidence and there's the highest chance of publication. And uh, also uh, two or three points that I would like to add, try not to duplicate your systematic reviews. Uh, already done systematic reviews, if you are able to identify a few more articles, it's better, better to add on to a few more articles to that systematic review, but just don't try to uh, repeat the same systematic review. It will not give you any other uh, further information. Uh, so these are my uh, references and suggested reading. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Pradeep, for taking us through the various uh, nitty-gritties of uh, the review articles. 
And yes, we need to understand uh, the various type of review articles when we talk about the evidence-based medicine. And you have nicely covered up uh, when we talk about the uh, narrative reviews, the scoping reviews, and finally the systematic reviews and requiring meta-analysis. We need to understand uh, why they are required, why they need to be done, and what is the understanding when they are published. So as an editor also, as a reader also, we need to understand the need for a particular type of review, and you have nicely uh, tried to incorporate the basic ingredients that must be a part of it and how to choose one. So I think we'll be coming to the questions after the <clears throat> next session. And the next important uh, session is uh, when we talk about uh, the publication of any research article, uh, most of the editors would like to see whether the uh, protocol which has been initiated by the researcher, are they available on certain platform? And that's become an essence. It's not just we are trying to verify the things, but it is also sometimes becomes ethical not to duplicate a study at multiple centers. And these requires uh, various uh, repositories or registries where it has to be. So I think this becomes important and we have the best person to take it uh, forward. Uh, Dr. Nishant Kumar, uh, professor at Lady Harding Medical College. Uh, he is uh, one of the uh, prolific academician. He is a prolific writer. He is a prolific, uh, I think he's a multi-talented person and he will do a very justice to this topic of registries for research and publication. He's associated with uh, journal editors for the last so many years. And I'm sure uh, his key points based on the evidence as well as his experience will help us to understand why, when, what all needs to be done when we talk about the states. Over to you, Dr. Nishant Kumar. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rakesh, for the, kind uh, for the kind introduction. And thank you for this opportunity to talk on an important aspect. Now, we know that there are certain registries for research and publications. Uh, these are basically required for clinical trial. Now, what is a clinical trial by definition? So if you go by the definition of a clinical trial, it's a research study which assigns human participants prospectively to one or more interventions to evaluate effects on health outcome. Now, it could be a device, it could be a drug, it could be comparison. Basically, it includes all trials, phase one to phase four. So basically, whenever we are dividing the human participants to different groups, that basically constitutes a clinical trial, whether we are observing one particular thing or another, and whenever we try to control the conditions of the trial, it is a clinical trial. And uh, by convention, by law, all such clinical trials have to be registered prospectively. Now, uh, what is a trial registration? So what do we mean by a trial registration? A trial registration is nothing, but we have to provide information and it has to be published regarding uh, it's a set of information. It's uh, basically certain points about the trial which you're going to conduct uh, on a particular website, on a particular registry regarding the design. What is the design of your study? How you're going to do it? What are the inclusion exclusion criteria? What is the primary objective? What are the secondary objective? What are the time frame? And there are other such uh, uh, questionnaires and uh, uh, points which will come to later. So these all points have to be agreed before you start a trial. Now, many times it has been said that research is like a fishing pond. You just sit there and then you evaluate what you have caught. No, it is not that. A trial is basically proceeding on set lines, set guidelines, which you have already defined. And these defined guidelines have to be made public before you can actually start recruiting patients. So it is a design, conduct, and how you administration, uh, how uh, you uh, overall administer, uh, uh, control this clinical trial. So that is basically part of trial registration. Now, why should one register a trial? That is one, that whatever you're trying to do, all the participants and everything, they are informed. The public is informed of any trial which is going on. It has a chance to reduce publication bias and selective reporting. Now, the thing is that you have committed that, okay, you'll study A, B, and C. Now, when you conduct your study, you find out, okay, C is not going on with what I had thought of initially. It is going negative to what I started with. So let me omit C. No. 
so you cannot omit C because you have committed that you will report on A, B, and C. So now that you have made it public, it is there in the public eye. Whenever we review an article, we go to this uh, registration site, see what he, what the protocol was, and you cannot deviate from it. So that is why you cannot selectively report. And again, we it has been commonly seen. Okay, we have got this much data. We'll do some. We'll collect some additional data which will which we had not um, uh, committed to. Now that we are doing this study, or as the study progresses, we'll commit this data and then make out two papers of that particular data. No, that is not allowed. So whenever we are making our protocol public, that means that we are sticking to that and we cannot deviate from that. As per the declaration of Helsinki, that is the declaration which controls the human trials registration in a public database before first recruitment, before you start study, before you start the study, before uh, uh, you enroll the patient, that information has to be provided in a public database. Also, as was there in the Prospero, as Dr. Uh, Pradeep had told about, awareness of identical trials to avoid duplication. When you register your trial, you come to know whether this trial has been done before or not. And when you are uh, describing the progress, now remember, when you're providing this information, this information has to be updated every six months. So you can always identify the gaps. If you have found out that there were some challenges or there was something wrong, you can correct that uh, by writing to the trial registry. Also, when uh, this is basically for the grant purposes and the industry purposes, the researchers and the potential participants they can know what kind of trials are going on. The industry can approach you. And if you're doing a, a trial on behalf of uh, the industry, certain researchers can uh, reach out. Okay, fine. This is my area of study. I can help with this trial. Similarly, between two universities. Okay, this is a, a trial going on in this particular college. Okay, I want to do, I have similar interests. Let us expand it to our college also. Then we'll have a multi-center study. The initial, when you submit the data, uh, there's an option of submitting your data also. So it will help in improvement in quality and identification of potential problems also, whether there's a problem in the data, whether the statistical uh, tests applied have been correct or not. As Dr. Dewey had said in the initial uh, uh, presentation, that most of the responses are, okay, there was this slight problem which was there. Now, if it is there in the public domain and as you're updating your data, other people can view that, other people who are following this particular trial, they can notice, okay, this is a slight uh, problem that you're hobby having and you can probably correct it before you actually uh, move on or you uh, publish the actual results. So there you have this, everything is made transparent and public and this can be beneficial. Now, uh, which trials are to be registered? Practically, all clinical trials, all randomized trials, wherever you are assigning groups, wherever you're doing an intervention, all trials have to be registered. Observational studies may optionally be registered. It is not mandatory to register them. And any trial after September 13th, 2005. So any time that you're recruiting a patient for an interventional trial after 2005, you have to have a registered trial prospectively. That means that before you enroll that patient, your protocol should be available on one of the uh, registries which is approved by WHO. So again, where should these trials be registered? Now, International Committee of Medical Journal Editors accepts primary registries in WHO network. So what are these primary registries? There are many registries which are available, but there are certain primary registries in the WHO network. WHO itself does not have its own uh, registry, but there uh, uh, certain countries and regions have been provided uh, the option, uh, they have their registries and they are the primary registry recognized by the WHO that they are doing good work and they conform to the standards set by the WHO. So the specific criteria are the content, that is there's a checklist of 20 to 24 points, whether the registry uh, offers those 20 to 24 points to the public, the quality and the validity, whether the quality of the data submit and whether the tests applied or the statistics that are going to be performed, whether the primary objective, secondary objective, how they're going to be observed, whether they're valid or not. Again, the validity of the uh, researchers. That means whether uh, it's a false trial, whether uh, the person exists or not, whether the trial is in process or not, 
everything is to be confirmed by the registry accessibility the accessibility means that the trial uh, information has to be available free of cost to everyone 24/7 365 days uh, and year and once registered it cannot be removed from the database it is for posterity so uh, any trial which is registered anyone can access it through the uh, trial number or the keywords or the author or the institute it it can be accessed anywhere anytime by anyone unambiguous identification now each trial which is registered is provided a proper number by the primary uh, registry and then by the who by the utn then there should be a technical capacity by the registry to perform all these now there are two different terms basically one is a register one is a registry a register just means a database that is a collection of data of the various um, uh, trials that are being registered now when we talk of a registry registry is the entire component the people working behind to maintain that register so the registry should have the technical capacity to undertake and uh, control these trials to validate uh, to make it accessible and to verify the content and overall the administration and governance is usually provided by the government of that country or region by country that means a particular country by region we mean a group of countries so it is not a region within a country and usually the primary registry is only one in a country or a region you cannot have two primary registries uh, within a country or a region and it is usually government controlled the government has a stake in it and government provides aids and help to maintain this particular registry so the various registries australian new zealand brazilian chinese uh, korean indian so clinical trial registry of india is one of the primary registries of uh, the who cuba uh, european union now this is the region now all the whole of europe except for uk has its own uh, trials register german is again separate iran japan uh, japan uh, lebanon thailand netherlands pan african so it is the entire of uh, entire africa peru and sri lanka so these are the primary registries uh, which are there with the who now you can register with with any of these registries these are usually open to all researchers anywhere in the world and uh, usually it is preferable to do it with a regional or uh, the country specific uh, registry but you can do it with anything and the um, most important of all is the clinicaltrials.gov that is the us registry that is also a primary registry so you can register with any of these registries so basically why do we do that now again as i said that it gives you more transparency uh, the uh, reviewers the authors the other people they can say okay this is a genuine thing whatever has been published has been committed to before that you're not deviating from the path and uh, when you publish your protocol there are researchers who would follow that particular if they have that same area of interest they might collaborate with you so it is an uh, sort of a networking thing also and then when you go through these registries you uh, uh, look for certain topics you go through the protocols you can actually identify okay this is a particular trial going on maybe i can do better maybe i can deviate maybe they have missed out something and i can plan my own study so that is the benefit of a registry now uh, remember all journals all journals uh, jocp and ija are part of icmje and uh, it is mandatory for all clinical trials to be registered with a primary registry of who now you can register with more than uh, one uh, registers but one of them has to be the primary registry as mentioned with the who so how do we do that now the most commonly done is the ctri so what do you do first you register for an account at ctri now the particulars and the email that you enter you have to enter someone uh, your guide your superior or some eminent uh, scholar or uh, one of the teachers in the universities or the college to vouch for you okay this is your account and uh, the particulars that you have provided for opening the account are correct so basically if my uh, pg wants to register an account for uh, at ctri they'll have to provide an email an email will come to me and i'll have to vouch for it okay fine this person is legitimate and he wants to open an account at ctri so that is how you open an account you are provided with a uh, username and a password you log in and the uh, when you log in you 
click on add a new trial. It opens a page, the main page, and uh, there's an option on click on add a new trial. The moment you click on that, a new window opens and it says a public title and a scientific title and a trial acronym. Uh, can you give me a minute, please? Okay. So you give a public title, you give a scientific title and trial acronym if possible. Now public title has to be in very simple language in common words, which a layman can understand. Scientific title is the one which you have decided for your study. Trial acronym is uh, optional. And then here in CTRI, you have the option of whether it is an Ayurveda trial or an allopathic trial. So you just select yes or no. Always remember to click on proceed. Now the moment you have done this, you are directed again to the home page. Yeah, so uh, this is how it appears. Uh, when you open, it says click here to add new trial. When you click on this, the, uh, the previous window opens. And once you have given the public title and the scientific title, it comes as pending. Now this trial I registered as NKM scientific title just to show you that how it is done. Now reference number and CTIR number is pending. So this is how the screen will look once you have given the public title and the scientific title. All you have to do is click on update here. So once you click update, a certain set of parameters which have to be provided open up. So public title of study and scientific title of study you've already done. Next you go to part two. You uh, click on this and the window opens like this. So the selected trial is NKM as I said. Secondary ID. Now, secondary ID is if you want if you want to register with uh, some other trial registry, that is where you get the secondary ID. You may or may not add it. Then, principal investigator or overall trial coordinator, you provide your details. Uh, then you give the contact person for the scientific query and public query. People may actually ask uh, what you're going to do, what are the harms, what are the benefits of the trial. So all this thing. Remember, you have to click on proceed after each entry and then click on go to the next part. So the moment you go to, on to the next part, the next part is monetary and material support. If it's a thesis, you can just write uh, institutional, uh, add new, you have to give the name of your source, college, whatever is there, uh, the name of the primary sponsor. If it's a grant, then you mention those details, right? Type is whether it's government, private, private funded, and secondary sense sponsor also, like if you have the institutional support and a funded research, the countries of uh, recruitment. Now, if it's a, a Indian study, you just select India. If it's a if it's a multi-centric international study, you select all the countries that are relevant. Again, you click on proceed. It will say that that the record has been added, and you go to the next part. Site of the study, where actually you are going to conduct this study. If it's a drug-based study, you'll need to furnish whether DCJ approval is needed or not, and if it is indeed need, needed. When was the document uh, approved? And you have to attach that particular document. Similarly, you have to attach your ethics committee certificate as well. Now, the most important part is next thing is health condition. Now, most of this, the thesis or the studies that we do are on patients, right? So we just click on the health condition, add health condition and trial participant details. We just select patients. That's it. We don't give the ICD classification, proceed, and we move on to the next step. Now, once we give uh, the condition as patients, next we get the whether it's a postgraduate thesis or not, and the type of trial is interventional, observational, whatever. And then it gives you this window. So instead of adding the conditions, if you can add the ICD-10 conditions, like if you want to do a study in only in lab coli patients. So you say, okay, uh, disease of the gallbladder, that is okay. That is those are that that is a subset of the patients that you're going to select. Uh, similarly, if you're going for breast surgery, you select, uh, select conditions of the breast, whether ben uh, benign or malignant. Now, if your uh, disease is wide, like laparoscopic surgeries, it can be gynecological, it can be surgical, it can include a host of other problems. So what you can do is you can just click on surgical anesthesia and then proceed. Now, study design is important, whether, whether it is a randomized control trial, whether it is non-randomized, whether it is observational. So that study design, blinding, so all those things you have to select from the drop-down box and enter details, proceed, go to the next part. As we had selected interventional study, 
because that is the most common thing that we do we have the intervention in the comparator agent so basically that is nothing but the groups so you add new the intervention and the comparator agent then we add the inclusion criteria that is age gender any other inclusion criteria that you have click on proceed similarly you add the exclusion criteria uh, click on proceed now if it was a randomized study then method of regenerating random end sequence method for elevation of concealment blinding or and masking if applicable so all these details have to be provided for an interventional study and then you click on proceed go to the next part now remember all these details you normally use and supply in your methods but here it is available and it acts as a cross check whether you have used these uh, particular data sets in your uh, protocol or not okay so we go to the next part next part is the primary outcome time points time points is points is important exactly when you are going to measure these so again you fill in the information and click on proceed similarly for secondary outcomes you enter the outcome you enter the time points and then click on proceed so when you click on proceed the uh, information that you have provided gets saved onto the website and then again you have to give the sample size as you have calculated uh, the phase of the trial phase 1 to phase 4 you have to select date of first enrollment now remember it usually takes around 15 to 20 days for this entire data set and a registration number to be allotted to you so the date of first enrollment should always be around 20 days to 1 month after you have started filling up this form and remember you cannot enroll any patient you cannot do your first case unless until your trial is um, permitted and you have a trial registration number okay then you say uh, estimated duration and uh, at the end as i said you have to review this every 6 months so once your study is completed you have to enter when was your last patient enrolled in your study okay again proceed go to the next part so global status you will say not yet recruiting india status not yet recruiting because you cannot recruit patients one uh, till you have uh, the registration done so after that publication details again that is that comes once your study is completed brief summary you just give the introduction and justification of the trial that is usually sufficient no references required click on proceed and after that you click when you are sure that your uh, information is correct you have given all the information you submit trial to the ctri after you have submitted uh, trial to the ctri then there will be another page which appears which says whether you like to provide the data once the study is completed or not so that is up to you whether uh, you would like to provide the data uh, that you have collected during the period of your study it is still optional it is not mandatory to provide uh, the data but you have to give that option you have to give that choice and you can modify it later also so after you have done this after you have submitted the trial to ctri you will get something which is called a reference number now this is where the majority of the students majority of the people are say, uh, are stuck they say okay we've got a reference number this is the trial registration number no this is just a reference number so you'll get something like ref the year the month and the number of the uh, study that you are in so remember this will tell you 2012 september 004000 uh, is the number for my reference study which has been submitted to ctri but that is not the end of it now remember there will be queries so whenever you log in you go into the this thing the tab of trial cl clarification modification ctri number won't be there it will still be pen uh, pending this will give you a date when it was sent back to you type of trial whether dci clearance was available or is applicable or not whether you have provided ec clearance or not and then you have to click on clarification to see what clarification they have they have asked for and you have to answer and make modifications in the entire data set that you have provided till now and then again click on submit now remember this is not a one time process they might review it three times four times five times even 10 times till they are not satisfied that the study that you are doing that the information that you have provided is appropriate or not so once they are satisfied that the information that you have provided is correct that it is going and it conforms to the trial that you are conducting only then you will get the 
CTRI number. So once you get the CTRI number, that means that your trial is registered. And this is the final number which you have to quote in all your studies whenever you are sending for publication. Remember, all international journals, they do not accept any clinical trial, any interventional trial, any RCT, unless until you provide with the trial registration number. And remember, CTRI also, it does not uh, accept retrospective uh, registration. So that means that if your study has started in 2017 and you're trying to uh, say in 2022 and now you're going to try, try and register your trial now. So, and if you give the date of recruitment as in 2022, it will not accept it. You have to start recruiting the patients only after you have uh, got uh, obtained a CTRI number. So there are many students who... Uh, don't realize, okay, fine, I have to register. They miss on the, they think this this, this reference number is uh, absolutely fine. We are already registered. Then they wake up from their sleep. Okay, fine. Okay, I have to get a CTRI number or they're informed that they have to have a CTRI number. And then they give get the clarification and they falsely uh, give a uh, wrong date. Remember, whenever uh, uh, the trial comes to us for publication, for review, we see the CTRI number. Now, as I said, it is CTRI 2012-09-003011. So that means that this trial was registered in 2012 in the month of September and this is the number, right? So uh, again, the thing is that we have to see that uh, and suddenly you'll say, okay, fine, I've given the CTRI number and I'll just write, I started my uh, study the study period is from, say, uh, June 2011 to June 2014, May 2014. Now, here I can catch you. You have said that you have started the study in June, but you have registered your trial only in September. So that is ethically wrong. You could not have started your th study. And it is mandatory for all thesis also. Recently, one of the very eminent uh, professors, uh, in, it happened in uh, Delhi conference only that uh, we made it mandatory that CTRI has to be there for uh, TN Jha if, uh, because this is all for uh, studies. So we said, okay, observational studies may be exempt, but all interventional trials have to have a CTRI. So very eminent professor had a fight with me. How can you make it mandatory? So I calmly said that you are a guide. You are an editor of an eminent journal. You know that it is mandatory. Now, if you don't have a registry number, how can you justify a study being carried on? So please remember it is legally and ethically wrong not to proceed with the study unless until you have registered it. And remember, this is the number that you have. You have to update it every six months. Like this was sent back to me in 2018, uh, whether this has been completed or not and whether it has been published or not. Once it's published, you have to provide the publication details also so that those people who are following it or if someone wants to go uh, search as a registry and is interested in your work will find the publication details and go directly to that particular page so uh, that is the thing and you should always have a registration number to quote and it should be valid and please do not start your study uh, unless until you get this number with this i'll end my talk thank you over to you, Dr. Rakesh. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Nishant, for this beautiful session. And uh, I must thank all the speakers for uh, very informative key points that will be useful for them during the publication that to be, needs to be included. Uh, if you have some questions, we can have it. Uh, Devlina, can you just check on the chat if you have some question or Dr. Radha Krishna wants to say something? Sir. Uh, Sabrina. Yes, sir, I'm here. Uh, so we have not received any question from the audience yet, sir, till now. I, I think uh, in that case, you can wind up, Rajesh. Yeah, so say, say something about the impact factor also. Okay, impact right. factor is covered. Yeah. Right, sir. I think uh, uh, when we talk about uh, the 
importance of a publication to readers, we need to incorporate all those important points which has been discussed today by the eminent speakers. And when we try to do it, the quality of the publications increases because we are including various points. And also we need to understand that when a person do a research, probably he had an experience of uh, including the nitty gritty. He may be doing everything fine, but for readers, uh, the message should be very clear that it has been done in a methodological way. And that is what the quality of uh, any journal is. And that is what we want. It's just not the quality of journal. What we want is that a single study is going to impact thousands of patients through various clinicians. And that is why we want that whatever is being published should be in a very scientific, methodological way of its publication. And these points were highlighted. Maybe in subsequent uh, sessions sometime, we will talk about different types of original articles. And these are essential for improving the standards of a journal. And that is what uh, Dr. Radha is saying. When we talk about the indexing agencies like PubMed, like Medline, when we talk about the citation indexes, when we talk about the impact factor, when we talk, uh, talk about the Medline indexation, when we talk about the clarity weight analytics, these are basically analyzed of a published literature based on the parameters that has been discussed today. And there are certain other things that needs to be done. I think uh, we can leave it for editors group sometimes later. This may not be a good uh, uh, discussion for the audiences who are listening for the benefit of the publication. But yes, uh, editors put a lot of emphasis on this because the repute of the journal will depend upon these small things. For example, uh, Dr. Nishant was mentioning about the CTRI. We were talking about the ethical clearance of a particular study. If these things are not noted into a published paper, then it becomes an issue for the integrity of that particular journal. And that's why we want that all those components must be there uh, when you are uh, putting up in a publication. The other aspect is uh, the point which uh, Dr. Pradeep Dongri was mentioned, that not only we have to make, follow certain published reporting guidelines, and the Equator Network is one of the very good uh, websites where each type of publication, starting from whether it is an original article, the retrospective study, the uh, uh, randomized control trial, or the systematic review meta-analysis, or even as such case reports, there are certain reporting guidelines which will incorporate all those important points. And hence, uh, this is a humble request to all the person who are listening to us that when you write a manuscript, just write an equivalent reporting guideline from the Equator Network website and try to see that whether all those points has been incorporated into your protocol, start from the protocol site, and when you send it for publication, ensure that all those points have been taken up. I think I'm sure uh, uh, the, the eminent speakers has given us a lot of important message. If we can incorporate into our guidelines, definitely it will be difficult for me to uh, reject a manuscript and we have a limited uh, page strength into our, uh, into our journal. So obviously we will, we will try to incorporate more publications, but yes, only when it has certain standards. It is standard, I mean, that it is going to benefit the readers and thus it is going to benefit the patients. And that is what the impact, that is what the main uh, motto of, uh, of any journal is. And I'm sure the, uh, all the potential authors uh, will try to incorporate all those important points. So once again, thank you. Uh, uh, Dr. Nishant, Dr. Divya, Dr. Sudish, Dr. Pradeep for sparing time and putting up such an important points which will be essential for the publications. Uh, over to Dr. Radha thank, you, thank, you, thank you, Rakesh. Before we wind up officially, something which I left out, I want to say that next week's webinar is an international webinar. The webinar is being organized by American Society of Anesthesiology for us. And the webinar is moderated by Dr. Bellani, Kumar Bellani of uh, Minnesota, who is our international dean. And he, with certain other friends of America, will be doing their webinar on certain specific topics. So kindly attend next week's webinar, which is not that one usually being done by us. And welcome you all to the next week's webinar. And I request Dr. Berry to say the formal word of thanks. Well, uh, thank you so much, sir. Uh, what a webinar it was.
uh, there was a lot to know and it was very appropriately uh, uh, worded scientific publications uh, what we need to know and i think with all the knowledge uh, which the learned speakers have provided to uh, the, the you know the audience uh, it surely is going to make the job a little more difficult either he will have to make the journals a little more fat so that he can accommodate uh, everyone or else uh, he'll have to increase the number of uh, uh, you know volumes well, friends, uh, this uh, was a very unique uh, webinar, unique in the sense that, uh, you know, we, we talk about NOCI, regional NOCI, general NOCI, you know, intubation, oxygen carrying capacity, and a lot of things related to NOCI, whether they are, whether it is the techniques or it is uh, the drugs or, you know, anything related to uh, what we use in NOCI. But <clears throat> this kind of information, we don't get in any textbooks. It's only with the word of mouth and uh, you know the, the senior people who have uh, contributed uh, to various journals it's from their experience and they pass on that experience to the youngsters so that way i think this is uh, a very unique uh, webinar and of course it will be i'm sure it would be a lot of uh, help to the youngsters particularly who are uh, beginning or who are stepping into the world of uh, academic uh, publications <clears throat> so <clears throat> I would uh, thank all the uh, four speakers, Dr. Devajan. She started so well with the letters. I mean, letters are not just, not just uh, you know, uh, some people uh, consider that it is just uh, a few lines and uh, that's it. But, you know, the letters can have uh, a, a lot of significance because they can provide food, of, food for thought uh, for subsequent uh, research or, you know, some idea. There may be something new that may come up in the mind. Uh, it was Dr. Sudish Kanan then who talked about the case reports. Again, uh, you know, the case reports uh, uh, are something which are uh, quite important. It may be stimulus for uh, further studies, further research may, uh, as he said it, uh, you know, they, they might uh, spark something uh, new, you know, a, a spark some idea, spark some uh, research question, uh, you know, which uh, the person can subsequently put, uh, you know, to, to test. <clears throat> then it was Dr. Pradeep Dongre. Uh, it was an extensive uh, article uh, on, the, on the review, I mean, how to publish it, and uh, what is the significance of uh, the review article, what are the various kinds of review articles that you have, and Dr. Nishant Kumar uh, thereafter. Uh, this information which he has provided, this is for research publication, because now it is becoming more, more and more significant. I, I think it's becoming very, very imperative for everyone to know that when you conduct uh, the research as he has uh, very uh, nicely highlighted that before you start uh, conducting it, you must register yourself, yourself because otherwise no foreign journal will be looking at, uh, uh, at, your, uh, at, at your work. And uh, well, uh, friends, there couldn't have been a better a moderator for uh, this uh, particular webinar, uh, more than, uh, better than uh, Dr. Rakesh Kumar. Uh, Rakesh Doug, who uh, is now the editor of Indian of NSA, as you all know, uh, a very accomplished, very academic, and uh, a person who has published a lot. And I think in the years to come, we'll uh, hear much more uh, about him with regard to his academic contribution uh, to various journals and, of course, to, uh, to, to uh, Indian uh, scientific literature. Well, uh, uh, on, on behalf of Indian College of Anesthesiologists, all the leadership of Indian College of Anesthesiologists, I thank all the speakers and of course the moderator once again for the excellent webinar that has been done. Thank you so much and uh, till we meet again next week. Uh, good night, stay happy, stay healthy.